<clears throat> so John, John, did you know um, Lion King is actually a Shakespeare adaption? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm so reading that somewhere. Oh yes, I did. Hello and welcome to Story Weavers, the podcast where we discuss anything and everything story related. Here, we'll delve into inspiration, plot, structure, character, and dialogue. Be it in books, movies, music, comics, television, or anything else, we'll be covering it from conception to reception. We'll be discussing between ourselves as well as with other creators and fans about their experiences, routines, and techniques. Join us and find your next inspiration. We're your hosts, Dean Bradley and John William Worth. And, and this, this is Story Weavers. I was going to say, like, I'm, I'm that weirdo, like at lunch, I'll read through IMDb and just read the facts of movies. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing that, like one of those rabbit hole moments where I saw like, oh, yeah, it, it took inspiration from Hamlet. And then you think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, it's Hamlet with a happier ending. Right. Basically. Yeah. No, I, 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 I had no idea till a coworker of mine um, brought it up yesterday. And my, my first guess was that it was based on Hamlet. And it was mm-hmm. I looked it up and it was actually intentional. Um, Disney Mm -hmm. wanted to basically make an Africanized version of Bambi. They wanted to take Bambi and set it in North Africa, you know, on the plains. When they presented it to the studio and the direct and I don't know, the producers, they basically said, you know, we do want an original story, but this is, you know, it's still a kid's film. We do like taking inspiration from well-known things so that when like adults view it, you know, they can find that resemblance and the similarities. Uh, and mm-hmm. someone said, well, what about Hamlet? And, and they ran with it. So the, the plot of Lion King is purposely Hamlet. rooted in Hamlet. Yeah. I had no yeah. idea. I just find it funny. Well, there's two things I think of one. It's a statement like how they made like Tarzan a few years later and how they made the hunchback of Notre Dame, mm-hmm. even Pocahontas. It's like, those are not exactly happy stories. So neither is Hamlet, you know? It's like oh, yeah. they took those stories and they Disney-fied them. Yeah. Especially like Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's like in the reality, that story ends with like everyone dying. Oh, yeah. So, and, but but um, a lot of it is based on real events just with fictionalized characters. Yep, exactly. Um, and then the second thing, like how you mentioned, like they wanted something familiar, but they wanted an original story. I like that contradictory idea because right. you see that with a lot of movies that take inspiration from Shakespeare. They even outright crib Shakespeare because I think Shakespeare's public domain at this point. Oh, it's been public domain for uh, a couple hundred years. I re- just realized yes. now with the look you were giving me that you were being sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, but, but our <laughs> listeners won't know this. Um, <laughs> but no, it's it, it's just so funny how people will say they want something original, but then they'll literally take a storyline from Hamlet and they'll say, yeah, let's go with that. It's like, it's just so funny, and that's how deeply mm-hmm. embedded in culture and art and literature and every every form of media that Shakespeare has become. It's just so mm-hmm. synonymous that he's both original but referential. Right, and well, I mean that's how he was at the beginning too, because a lot of his plays were based on stuff too. That was that was actually going to be the question I was just going to ask you because I I don't know a whole whole lot about Shakespeare's life. I have a biography of his mm-hmm. that I have not read yet. But yeah, because obviously in modern times and for the past few centuries, you know, a lot of stories uh, follow plot lines and structures that are based on Shakespeare. So I, it's, it's, I'm just curious what, you know, where Shakespeare's inspirations came from. Because I mean, a lot of his stories do have very similar plots. I mean, he has he has his tragedies and in if I'm not mistaken, every tragedy, like the main character and his romantic interest die at the end of them. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, his comedies almost always have some form of someone in disguise pretending to be someone else to get information or purposely having someone say something so that someone else overhears it, you know, for comedic effect and people, you know, think there's two different things going on those are things that are very common in all of Shakespeare's works that mm-hmm. at least the ones I'm familiar with yep so there are a lot of common traits and you see that with any creator I would say you start seeing the commonalities between all of their works it's mm-hmm. 
you know, as unpredictable and as different as we can try to be, we're still like, it's human nature to kind of like reuse their own stuff or be like repetitive to an yeah, extent. I mean, it, it goes back, uh, we, we say it in almost every single episode. It's, it's the, the universality of the human experience. It, it all goes back to, to Joseph Campbell's works. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and at least talking derivative. about Shakespeare, Mm -hmm, where he gets his inspiration, it was largely historical. Like, well, yes. um, obviously Henry VIII and every, or all Henry of his Fifth, histories. Rather, um, Romeo and Juliet was based on an older story. Uh, yeah. Titus Andronicus was based on an older story. It's uh, like some I of them, know. even the yeah. titles were disappeared. Like a lot of his plays were not really original. They were based on something he was just, else. He was writing screenplays based on stories he was familiar with, and then he just Shakespeareized them. Right. Which, you know, what, one of the things we, we wanted to bring up at some point was like, why is Shakespeare still so widely regarded and respected? It's like, you know, you read him in high school and it, everyone, it's a pain in everyone's ass because the teacher goes through it line by line by line. But then as an adult or even as a teenager, if you just read it mm -hmm. as a normal person, you then see how it works because you get like, oh, he made the first your mama joke. Oh, yeah. this is toilet humor. Like you actually read it and it's actually very vulgar and you lose a lot of that humor and a lot of that intricacy when mm -hmm. you're looking at it so finely with a fine tooth comb. Well, think, and it's like when, when Shakespeare was writing this, he wasn't writing it for academic purposes. He no, was it writing was entertainment. it for entertainment. Yeah. Exactly. It's just like how um, like Dostoevsky. Now mm -hmm. he's regarded as like this giant in Russian literature he was writing for the masses. He wanted to make bestsellers. He wanted to make money. Yeah, he was trying so, to make the aristocracy look bad. Yes, and he <laughs> succeeded very well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's like Shakespeare. It's like he probably – I would compare him maybe to Christopher Nolan where it's like he made art house films with a budget. He would mm -hmm. make these plays that were very, very entertaining and very, very – you know, they were thrilling because it's like, mm -hmm. imagine the first time you actually read Romeo and Juliet, you do kind of get caught up in the, th even if you know what's going to happen. Right. You kind of get caught up in it. Well, the prose so, is just so beautiful in that one. Exactly. But even under the surface, there's just a lot going on. And it's mm -hmm. like, he says a lot with so little. So he was, he was appealing to the mass appeal to yeah. like the, the, the crowds but at the same time if you actually look at his plays and like like again study them you actually see there's a lot more going on he's saying a lot more oh, yeah than what his characters are speaking so it's like he, he's doing both he's regarding the critics and the audience mm -hmm. um, well, i think one of the difficult things at least it was for me um reading not just shakespeare but even like the odyssey or or older texts in high school so much of it for me it wasn't I mean, you're able to figure out the story, but sometimes when you're just like reading a sonnet or reading a conversation between two people, if you're not familiar with his style of writing and language, sometimes it's literally just difficult to know, like, what the fuck is he saying? What, like, I don't like, you know, not, not just like, what are the words, but like, what does it mean on a basic surface yeah. level can be very difficult. And I know when I, I guess I'll give a little bit of my brief history with Shakespeare um, mm -hmm. before we really start diving into the the film adaptions of them. You know, other yeah. I read Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet and Midsummer Night, Midsummer Night's Dream in high school. You know, I think we probably watched at least a film of each of them. The only one which I remember is Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Um, of course, yeah. But other other than that, honestly, like I hated Shakespeare for the longest time, and then over COVID, I decided to give it another shot and I read the base I, I started chronologically from you know the information we have available as to ha where the chronology is and then read right. like the first half of his plays but I was reading them purely for for entertainment interest um and obviously reading Shakespeare is very very different from watching Shakespeare um and I that's yes. how I want to I think that's a good way to kind of get into the meat and potatoes of it is because I myself, mm -hmm. I've never gone and watched a live Shakespeare production and I'm very saddened by it because I had an opportunity to go to the Globe Theater when I was in London with some friends of mine and I didn't and I regret it. Mm. Um, so, and I, so I really, really, um, uh, that's something on, on my bucket list that I need to do yeah. because I've never seen a live performance either. And that now that you bring it up, that is something it, 
it might not be like Lion King level of production, but it's like it's just something to something to brag about. Yeah, like I well, saw Shakespeare on stage. Yeah, well, and it's also just like that. That was that was the medium they were written for. It was meant to be in front mm-hmm. of a live audience with live actors. Um, but the vast majority of people know Shakespeare from adaptions, and yes. there are also a lot of movies that are adaptions of Shakespeare plays that people don't know about, like The Lion King, which was, I mean, one of the biggest movies when I was a kid, when we were, when right. we were kids. Um, that goes right over your head, obviously, when you're a kid, but like every child learns the story of Romeo and Juliet at sometimes mm-hmm. a shockingly young age. It's just such a big story that's just so common. And then, like, you learn about Macbeth, too. Like, you, even if you don't know what the story of Macbeth is, you know, like, you don't say the word Macbeth in a theater. Right. Um, you know, it's got that that connotation to it. It's just so well known. It's, mm-hmm. it's just part of – it's part of culture yeah. in general. And, like, you know, how you mentioned, um, like, you watch some um, foreign mm-hmm. Shakespeare films. Yeah. Like, um, what was it? I watched – in college, one of my favorite film films that we watched was Akira Kurosawa's Ron, which is based on King Lear. And, I need to see that because I because I oh, watched Throne a, of Blood, which is Kurosawa, and I was just like mm-hmm. in. That's one of his earlier I works. Absolutely too. loved it. I believe Throne of Blood was early. It's black and white, correct? Yep, it's black and white. I have it right yep. here. It was nineteen fifty seven. Ron is like. Ron was 1985 mm-hmm. and it's in color and it's, it's very much like Kurosawa's work, very painterly because he storyboarded his films like paint with paintings. Mm-hmm. And according to him, he never even intended for it to be based on King Lear, but then he started seeing the similarities between the two. So it's like, okay, Akira Kurosawa is very obviously well read. He made Dostoevsky adaptions. He made Shakespeare adaptions before. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, it's the right. fact Purposeful that Shakespeare just, yeah, it started to worm its way in anyway. And like one of the things I mentioned before in another conversation was you can tell it's based on Shakespeare because in Ron, there's a fool character Mm -hmm. and that has no basis in Japanese culture. It's literally made up just for the movie, just to give that character a part. Right. And you know, it's like when you find out that, Oh, this famous Japanese filmmaker made Shakespeare adaptations it, it's just kind of like it, it gives you a little bit of a shock for a second. Like that's how, because obviously the, the the language and the dialogue doesn't translate, right? But it, it's just the universality of the story itself, mm-hmm. and it just goes between cultures and between language. Well, and that's um, the thing that's fascinating too when it comes to film adaptions is because you get film adaptions like chimes at midnight you get film adaptions like much ado about nothing that are titus they're pretty much word for word they're basically reading shakespeare those are their lines it's not it's not been changed but it doesn't make them any better or worse in my opinion than the ones that just take the themes the overarching uh plot lines and characters and change the text, change the setting, change the timeline, um, Mm -hmm. add things, remove things. It doesn't matter to me. Right. Like it can still, it can still fail because there was a recent Romeo and Juliet adaptation with I think Haley Steinfeld was her name. This was several years ago and it got, it it was done in the time of Romeo and Juliet, Mm -hmm. I believe like the 1500s, but they threw out the dialogue Mm -hmm. and that was one of the points of criticism of the film was yeah. that it, it, it just kind of like lost its life. Well, when it took I, all that I, fanciful Romeo dialogue and, away. Romeo and Juliet is also one of those, like part of the reason is because the dialogue in that play is the screenplay is it's so flowery good. It's so flowery. It's beautiful. I remember like when I first read it in high school, I was like, Oh, cool. Love story. He, he thinks she's dead. He kills himself. They both die, you know, la di la da um but when i read it you know in the last couple of years i mean i it it like dawned on me just how beautiful it is um yep. just the the imagery he uses in the way he he construes the text um yes. I, I, don't, I don't i don't have the words for it i don't know how i'm trying to say it but like it was just it it really it affected me more than almost any other literary work i've read and it wasn't my first mm-hmm. time reading it 
See, this, this is like a little random tidbit, but like part of like the history of the English language is that English was always considered kind of was earlier considered like the poor man's language. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially in England when like French was what French was what real wealthy people, the powerful people spoke. Right. And I think it was Geoffrey Chaucer was one of the first people to use Middle English, I think it was with Canterbury Tales. Mm-hmm. He wanted to write in what's called plain English. Right. And that's why you get a lot of those earlier works. They're very, very fanciful because they're purposely trying to flower up the language to some extent. Shakespeare, since he was writing for the masses, he wrote in English. So that's why his plays, like if you look at his plays too, Mm -hmm. common people speak in normal normal paragraphs. But then wealthy and powerful people or the protagonists speak in a a rhythm, in a poetic manner. Mm -hmm. And it's like he was – he was flower. He was like primping it up to make it fancier, and that the right. same thing John Milton did with Paradise Lost. So it's like, yeah, they were written in a time where English was not considered a beautiful language, mm-hmm. and you got these people saying, "No, it can be. It can yeah. be beautiful." So right. th- it's like, to some extent, you can almost thank Shakespeare for almost like bringing English onto the world stage, mm-hmm. and especially since it's funny because. Half the words are made up. He was Dr. Seuss yeah. before Dr. <laughs> Seuss was alive. Yeah. But so many of those same words were added to the dictionary and they became actual words that people use these days and mm-hmm. you don't even think they're from Shakespeare. Right. Yeah. So, they just became such a – yeah, everything just became such a natural part of conversation because because it mm-hmm. wasn't just commoners that went to she- see Shakespeare plays. Right. Yeah, you know the nobility, the the queen. The nobility up in the rafters. She used to go, yep. You know they all they all used to go. And I mean that's that's part of what makes him appealing even now is that anyone can enjoy Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Like it because like I said, like when you're in high school, like when I was in high school, the first play we read was Romeo and Juliet, like in junior high or something. And again, when it was interrupted by like looking at it line by line, you don't get the beauty, you don't get the intricacy in the story. But then when mm-hmm. you actually One of the smartest things our high school English teacher did was she had us just read a few pages of Shakespeare. She went off script. And it's like, that's when I first kind of like all of us kind of got hit by like, oh, this guy knows how to write. And even if you don't understand, even if you don't understand like every word and every line that's coming through. When you yes. read it as a whole, it, you 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 made this point a couple episodes ago. Um, it was probably about Finnegan's Wake. You just you just read it. You go through. Yep. You read it, and and you take what you can from it. Right. You don't have to understand everything to 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 get mm-hmm. it and to let it affect you. Yeah, T. S. Eliot's The Wasteland. That's it was in an introduction for that poem because that poem is like one of the hardest things to read in the English language. And this woman, Mary Carr, she basically said 70% of what the author wants you to get is right there on the surface. If it's right. not, then they failed. The, the author doesn't want to write a story that no one's going to get. Yeah. Like James Joyce, even with Finnegan's Wake. You James just Joyce, start, thank you. James Joyce, yeah. If you name. start to get like a – like even if you don't get the story the way he wanted you to, you start to paint a picture – on your own right of what the story is trying to tell you and exactly like like with Shakespeare it's like every other word like you look at most printings of his plays there will be like little footnotes where all the words this is what this means this is what apothecary means Mm -hmm. but it's like if you just read the paragraph you get it's like oh the guy deals drugs yeah (laughs) I mean the first the first first few plays I had I had read, I had like Wikipedia open next to me. I would read like what happens in act one, scene one. And then I would read act one, scene one. And I did that for the Mm -hmm. first few, just, just so that like I could get through it and know like, this is what's going to happen. Let me see how he's writing it. But after like three or four, I started putting Wikipedia away and just reading them. Unless I got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm fucking lost. and I'm not going to keep reading. If I don't know what's going on, then I might look it up. Um, but yeah, I do, I, I do the same thing, but I'll read the whole like book or play and then I'll read like the summary and I'll be like, oh, so this is what that was. And, yeah, know. but but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to know I wanted to be a little bit more familiar with it Proactive. as I was going, because I was also, you know, I was trying to read what, 40, 39, 40 plays was my goal. And I was right. like, I'm not rereading these right now. 
Right. Um, yep, I understand. So, but let's let's um, move let's move to specifically film adaptions. We spent a good bit of time just talking about Shakespeare, the influence of yes. Shakespeare and his works, but um, mostly my fault. But yeah, <laughs> no, I mean I was going on on about it too. Um, yeah. So let let's talk about film adaption specifically let's and let's start with chimes at midnight because yeah. uh you and i did a watching party of that a few weeks ago you had never seen it uh i had seen it for the first time earlier this year and absolutely fell in love with it i've seen it quite mm-hmm. a few times now um so yeah tell us about chimes at midnight or what so your thoughts at- were on it as as a shakespeare adaption so Chimes at Midnight remind me it's based on Henry the Fifth, Henry the Fourth, Henry the Fourth, and and in I don't think it really gets into Henry the Fifth. It's but it's Henry the Fourth, Part One and Part Two. Yeah, it's, and it's basically told from the perspective of one of the side characters. Who, who what was his name again? It was Falstaff. Orson Welles's Falstaff, which is actually it's it's, it's 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 that Falstaff. The 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 film has like two names, and it's commonly known as both. Uh, at as chimes at midnight, but it's also known as Falstaff. Yeah, you see that you see both and, of them, and it largely it. Whereas the play, because I've never actually read, I've only read Henry V, but mm-hmm. it's like whereas those kind of like they jump between the characters, and Falstaff is a supporting role, mm-hmm. as is the young prince soon to be king. Mm-hmm. It's like in the movie, they're the central role, and to right. me. Like watching the film, I was struck by two things besides like the wonderful performance because it's Orson uh, Welles. Yeah. One, I was struck by the physicality of the film, not just of the actors, but of the mm-hmm. camera too, because it's constantly moving and the cutting was just like chop, 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 chop. And it's because Shakespeare's plays, if you read them, there's very little stage direction. Oh, it's like if, it's if, all if, left if to almost, the imagination. If pretty much all the stage direction is uh enter these pe- <laughs> these people enter these people exit so you know who's yep. in the room and other than that like stage director's got to figure it out which is yes, also which I... what makes the film adaptions you can go so many different directions with them exactly all you have is is the is the lines right which pretty much illustrate what's going on um, but then you get the actors who can perform it and like run around. Like I just remember the scene where it's like they're in like the bar whorehouse combo thing mm-hmm. where it's like all the women are rushing around. There's all the billowings of the skirts and you get Falstaff like lumbering around among them. And it's like this beautiful dance. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the first thing. Cause I love, I love watching camera movement in film and I like seeing just how, like how directors and cinematographers position the camera and like it to move and then cut and everything. And it creates the rhythm, mm-hmm. um, especially Orson Welles. Cause he was a stunning visually with his films, but also I was, while I'm assuming, you know, Henry the fourth and all those were, aren't happy, happy plays. They're, they're still really. considered tragedies. Yeah. This well, they're, was definitely they're much his... more tragic because it followed Falstaff. Like I yes. remember, not being like, like when I say upset, I wasn't like angry, but like at the ending, I actually looked up like, okay, why, why did the new King basically cut Falstaff out of his life so brutally? Cause it's like, yeah, you know, yeah this guy used you, but he was also your one true friend and you cut him out. And I actually had to read up historically on why a character would do that. I assume um, I, why well, I, I I'm curious to see what the actual answer is. My assumption mm-hmm. was it was just the effect that the death of his father had on him and the way his father was treating him and basically trying to tell him, like, you're going to be king. Stop running around with these lowlifes and and learn how, you know, learn how to take over my position, learn how to rule a state. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, a sen- that's essentially what it was. It was... At the time, you know, the king cutting out a low life from his life would not have been an unusual thing to see. Right. Mm-hmm. But it almost, you know, I don't want to say like Shakespeare was a time traveler. He knew what he was doing. It's almost like he knew there would be immense sympathy for the character as well. Mm-hmm. Because it's like this this guy, like, you know, yes, he, he milked the prince for all he was worth. Mm-hmm. But he also meant well for the guy. Like, he, he, he was still oh, like... Yeah. A, a, almost a he felt he felt he, he like yeah well and and henry like felt bad uh i think you know definitely had some remorse about doing what he had to do but i think he also you don't think so no because from what i understand in the plays 
he never expresses remorse for what he's done. I mean, that also depends on the performance, perhaps. Yeah. But I just remember like the sternness that Henry spoke to Falstaff with. At the end. And yeah. then I read up like later on, like oh, like the the old woman delivering that little soliloquy about mm-hmm. like how Falstaff died essentially of a broken heart. Yeah. And then from what I understand in Henry V, he never even mentions Falstaff's name. He literally yeah. cuts the guy out of his life. So it's yeah. like, it takes this kind of sad, but also historical story. And it makes it just like this tragic tragedy. Well, and when, when you're again, like I had never seen um, a performance of Henry the fourth before I had read the play. And then I, mm-hmm. I saw chimes at midnight and you, you, I would never, that, that was like the brilliance of Wells. He made this secondary character who's, who's, he's kind of like, he's meant to be the fool of the story. Yep. He's meant, he's put there for comedic relief, but he's never central to the story right. at all in, in the play. But that's his, from what I remember. And Wells was able tragedy. to take him. Yeah. But Wells was <laughs> able to take it and basically go, you know, it's not just, you know, this young king ascending to the throne. Like that's, that's not only what this story is about. It's also this fool who actually believes that the prince can stay his friend when he becomes king. Right. And it's, it almost speaks to how all of us kind of like daydream sometimes. It's like, oh, what if so-and-so became po- famous? What if so-and-so did this? They'd probably cut you out of their life or they would forget you. And it's the sad, tragic truth. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, that's why, like, I read, like, you know, yes, in Shakespeare's time, that would be a completely normal thing to do to Falstaff. But at the same time, there would have been sympathy because it's like, it's hope. Right. He, he, he wanted to keep his friendship with this cool guy. And the mm-hmm. cool guy said, now nah, we're in different crowds now, bro. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what I thought of Chimes of Midnight. I greatly enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Very much so. Yeah, no, I, oh, so good. We've both seen multiple Shakespeare films, Mm -hmm. and some of them are complete. Like, they're the complete text, like you mentioned. Right. One example I always think of is Kenneth Branagh's... Much Ado About about Nothing. No. Well, that, yes. But, um, do I have it? Yeah. Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet. Oh, his Hamlet. Yeah, okay. That one I have not seen. So one of the things you mentioned earlier about, like, Shakespeare adaptations... Um, is sometimes they stick with the full text and other times they cut and they abbreviate, they abridge, or they completely rewrite the text out altogether. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, when I think of complete Shakespeare adaptations, like there's a few, like you mentioned, much ado about nothing. Another Kenneth Brown on movie is Hamlet, which was made in 1996, had an all-star cast with Kate Winslet, Robin Williams, Billy Crystal, Gerard Depadieu. Um, it was like four, four and a half hours long. Wow. It's literally every word. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautifully made film. Absolutely stunning. But it is a sore ass movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's just through. a struggle to get through. Exactly. Um, but then, like I mentioned, that earlier adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, where they cut essentially the heart of the story up just to say, to appeal to the lowest common denominator, where it's. Mm-hmm. They're treating their audience like they're dumb. And in my experience, you can't do that. You have to treat your audience like they have at least a little bit of intelligence. Right, yeah. And that's what Shakespeare requires. You, he, It makes you pay attention because if you don't pay attention oh, you're to Shakespeare, so lost. you will lose. Exactly. That's yeah. the fun. It's like his, his words, like I think of the way Virginia Woolf's prose is described. It's like a billowing tent. And sometimes there's just stones dropped at the corner. But if you don't pay attention, that tent's going to just blow away. Yeah. Um, but – you know, there, there's other adaptations, like to compare Hamlet to Hamlet, there's an Italian director named Franco Zeffirelli who made one in 1990 with Mel Gibson, Glenn Close, and Helena Bonham Carter. Ooh, that and it's like good. two, two, and it, it's, I haven't seen the full thing, but it, it's Hamlet. It's a well made yeah. Hamlet. And, you know, it, it's like two and a quarter hours. So obviously a lot's been cut. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it kind of begs the question. Is, is Shakespeare one of those things that you can get away like cutting and abbreviating and abridging or I think sure I mean part of the reason you have to think too that why his why his plays were so long you know a lot of his stories could have been told in much more condensed versions but people were going to you know it was an outing people made a day of it people were going out they were buying food they were buying drinks they were visiting local vendors they were spending time in the town 
Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was okay if it was long, they, you know, they had intermissions, you know, people, it was, it was, you were expected after a certain amount of time to get up and move around for a little bit before you came and sat back down. You were never expected to sit and watch four hours of Shakespeare without a break. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's, that's like the debate that cause killers of the flower moon came out recently or yeah, within the last like month or two. And that movie is an, is another bum numbing film it's like three and a half hours brilliant film from what i've heard but again it's long and i remember reading that i think it was whatever whoever the production company was oh apple <laughs> was going to sue some theater chains because they were inserting intermissions in the movie mm-hmm. because it was so long well, and people i remember have to pee was- when they're drinking that much soda i know but thelma shoemaker who is the, uh, the editor for i think all of Scorsese's movies and she's mm-hmm. won like four Oscars. So, you know, she, she, she knows, knows what, what she's, she's doing. doing. She knows what she's talking about. She, she was like horribly critic you know, critical of inserting like a, um, a an break. intermission. Yeah. I would actually, you know, honestly, I would rather have, I would rather go see a four hour movie that had one or two intermissions in it than to like, like they've done with so many of the, the fantasy or or comic movies nowadays where they get split into two parts and eat yeah each part's still two and a half hours and you're having to wait 12 to 8 you know 12 to 18 months at least to see yes. the second part a lot of that's done for money reasons though because money. you get two box office hits instead of just one but right. like i would rather go and just make a day of it go for 2 hours take a 15 to 30 minute break get some food go to the bathroom get in the light, get some sun and then go mm-hmm. back in and finish the rest of it. Because, I mean, because like films said. are the only medium that do that. If you go to an orchestra, there's an intermission, you know? Yeah. Well, like every, how you every, said, like, you know, with, the, with Shakespeare's plays, they were all day affairs. Like people yeah. would come in from the countryside to go to London to see these plays. So they would go to the shops, they would go to the vendors, they would get food and stuff. So it was kind of like the whole town or the whole city would kind of like rally around this event. Mm-hmm. And let's look at movies like that probably cost a decent penny. It was probably like a few months worth of wages for sure. these commoners to go. Let's look at the state of the movie industry. Now tickets are expensive. Oh, you want to get food? It's like a, a thing of a medium popcorn is like 10 bucks. Yeah. Um, and minimum wage is seven twenty five. So it's like, that's two hours of labor for a thing of popcorn. Yeah. Um, you get the advertisements for the movie you know, which could go like 30 to 45 minutes. Oh, that was that's um, the last time I went to the movies. I timed it. It was like 25 minutes. I was like, this is not a, a, a 90 minute film I'm going to see. When I saw Dune in IMAX, I timed it 40 minutes of previews. Yeah. And it was, it, it, it's like how, how you just described it. It sounds like, you know, an all day affair. What does a three hour movie like Dune with an hour, let's say of previews, as well as 30 minutes to, you know, you come in, you park, you get the ticket, you get the food, you sit down. That's your whole afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> right there. Yeah, right. So and, and so the excuse that like, oh, you couldn't, you know, make longer movies with intermissions because, you know, we have other films to show. Well, you're showing 40 minutes of previews already. Yes. You know. <laughs> and you're making your money with the tickets and pr- – Mostly with the food because oh, so they're not really making theaters. much money with the tickets, but right. but I get and the I'm, point you're making. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like inserting an intermission or a theater chain coming up and saying, "Look, it's fine that you make three, four hour movies. In fact, I would love that because that gives the directors more leeway to do what they want." Just like Shakespeare, he just wrote plays, yeah. big plays, at mm-hmm. a time when paper was like twenty bucks a page. <laughs> and you know, yes, make your film, but at three hours, you must insert one intermission. At yeah. four hours, you must have like a 10 minute intermission. Yeah. And I mean, movies in the 50s and 60s did that. They would have a 10 minute intermission so that you could go to the bathroom. No one ever complained. Dr. Zhivago didn't lose anything because of it. Yeah. I mean, if you don't want to do it, wait till it's available and you can own it. And, you know, you can choose to watch it with or without an intermission. Exactly. You know, I'd, I'd be totally cool benefit. with that. That sounds great. <laughs> that's the one, the two benefits of like Shakespeare now on film or any long movie as opposed to back then, it's like one, home viewing, it's out in like a month, and two, subtitles. So mm-hmm. if you're in the theater and you don't quite get what's being said or you or you chronically fall asleep in the theater, rent it on DVD. Yeah. <laughs> or not rent, but like 
You right. know what I mean? DVD. I just aged myself. What's DVD? Hey, Dean here. Just wanted to take a brief moment to remind everyone of our book of the month for January 2024. This month, we'll be reading the 2021 novel by Becky Chambers called A Psalm for the Wild Built. This novel is the first in Becky's ongoing series, Monk and Robot. Taking place on the fictional world of Panga, this short novel follows our protagonist, Sibling Dex, as they wander away from the city and into the wilderness, searching for identity in this post-technological world where the robots have left human civilization to find an identity of their own. We hope you'll read along with us this month. The episode for A Psalm for the Wild Built will premiere at the end of January. Now back to the episode. We started this discussion talking about whether it's okay to abridge or cut Shakespeare. And and honestly, like, I, yes. Because let's be honest, if you weren't going to cut it in modern days, most people would have no interest in going to see them. Right. Like, and that's the one thing and, that and as well, Hamlet was a critical was a critical darling but a financial failure yeah no one wanted to sit for four hours yeah well and also to a lot of people in modern days they don't want to go to the movies and hear um the language in the text in a form that is difficult for them to understand i tried having my parents watch chimes at midnight with me and they just stopped because they were totally lost they weren't able to follow the prose um, yep. Which is understandable See, if you're not if you're not familiar with it. So being able to scrap the text and just take plots, themes, characters, scenes, and adapt them, even if you want to adapt it in into the same time period, you know, if you want to change mm-hmm. it up so that it can be e- more easily received by a modern audience, like that makes sense. And but what that's what's fascinating to me about Boz Lerman's is because his is mostly like text for text but it's so visually appealing. It's just got that kinetic energy. Yeah. Every single shot. Yeah. Well, and, and Romeo and Juliet is the one of, of all of Shakespeare's plays. That's the one that everyone is mostly familiar with, at least the general outline of the plot. Maybe you don't know, you know, who Mercutio is, but you're still able to follow what's, what's going on as you're watching Mm -hmm, the film. But if you're watching um, the histories or if, well, I mean, because because part of it is like also adjust. Sorry if I'm interrupting, but Mm-mm. part of it is also adjusting for your audience because obviously audiences have changed. They expect different things. Um, like once again, Kenneth Branagh, his first Shakespeare film was Henry V, and none of the battle scenes are actually seen in Henry V the play because obviously they couldn't have that kind of production value. Right. In the film, it's shown in mm-hmm. graphic detail yep. and first of all it was filmed on like a small budget so they worked with like five guys so they made it all work really well but it's like you can show things that shakespeare couldn't show yep. so that part was one of it of the to other me is I like to bring up yeah it would be also the way i would see it is like okay if shakespeare were alive today how would he want this stage would he want to show the battle scenes would he want to show you know the blood and the guts and the glory and the the horrid horror i'm pretty sure he would say yes hell yeah i want to show it yeah um but, that's but at the, but, but at the time the you know they were limited we we talk about talked about this with josh there they were limited by the technology there was no mm-hmm. film it's all about <laughs> there were no that cameras also, that also brings up another point that I wanted to mention was it's not just about the visuals and the energy of Shakespeare's plays being adapted to film or any other medium. Um, it's also the acting. It's yes. a very front and center stage because to yes. me, part of the way the part of the reason Boz Lerman's Shape Romeo and Juliet works is because of the frenetic pace Mm -hmm. but also because you got some damn good actors who know how to read shakespeare like yeah i think of i think of the apothecary pete postelway i think that's how you say his name Mm -hmm. he's like a very very well established actor i think he's done stage work so it's like to plop him into that role is like wonderful and then you got like leonardo dicaprio and um what was it? Claire Danes? Claire Danes. Who actually didn't they didn't like each other on set. Oh no. <laughs> but it's like they were both as young as they were, 
you gave them Shakespeare's lines and they could read them convincingly. Mm -hmm. Some actors probably wouldn't be able to get away with that. And then you get other actors like, um, sorry, one one more story. It's like the the Cohen, well, Joel Cohen's adaptation of the tragedy of Macbeth with Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. Denzel Washington did, did something interesting. Instead of like reading the lines, like it was a poem he read Macbeth's lines in a conversational way. Stop. That's that's exactly the point I was getting ready to like make. Yep, and it sounds like hearing it. It's like you're just listening. It's like, oh, so that's probably how they said that in Shakespeare. Yeah, time. like they weren't like, like singing it; they were speaking it. And yeah, it's like he, hearing, now I see why he got the Oscar nomination. <laughs> hearing Shakespeare versus just reading Shakespeare in your head, or just yes. reading it out loud when you're just you know trying to read the text. You know, you yes, kind of have the, like- the natural iambic p- pentameter as you're as you're reading it. But like the the best Shakespeare acting I've seen in movies is when is when they insert pauses or yes. or, or or they'll or they'll put periods or commas in places there normally aren't. And the inflections they make. Um, yes. It where they make it conversational. I, I, that's I really, really noticed it in um, in Kenneth Branagh's Much Ado About Nothing which also yep. has Denzel Washington. Um, yep. But actually, I noticed it with Kenneth. It's it's funny. I, I, keep, I notice it with the people who are directing these films who also play in them, like Wells. I notice yep. their takes on these characters they play are vastly different than how I would have heard it in my head. Yes, and it's like... And, and, and it's well, like that light bulb, like, oh, like, I get it. Yeah. I mean, well, because the other thing, like, again, I go back to Macbeth with Denzel Washington because it's watching it. It's like part of performing on stage is you want to be big. You want to be bold because you're performing mm-hmm. to the – I think they say you're performing to the last row. Yeah. On film because the camera is close and it sees every little pore on your skin. You want to do things smaller. And it's like the, the one, one of the scenes is the finale with Macbeth, spoilers, <laughs> um, is there's a sword fight be- between him and Macduff. I believe it I is. actually have not seen a version of Macbeth with the original text. I've only seen adaptions and I have not read it. So I've never seen okay. it in Scotland. <laughs> I've, I've seen <laughs> so, it in Mumbai and I've seen it in Japan. <laughs> ooh, okay. Because so like it's, it's a sword fight and there's a little conversation. And it's like Denzel Washington as Macbeth. It's like as he's speaking, he's like shaking his head. It's like, no, no, no. But he's he's speaking Shakespeare's lines and it feels so much more natural and human. Mm -hmm. And it's just so fascinating to watch that because you expect Shakespeare. Like I seen Roman parts of Roman Polanski's Macbeth. Oh, I didn't know he did a Macbeth. It was just after the, um, the, the helter skelter, the Manson family murder. So his wife had just been killed and it's a bloody movie. It's a horrific film. It's a good film, but it's, yeah, it's true. Macbeth. But it's like the acting is much more melodramatic. And then you get this where it's like everything gets pulled back, mm-hmm. where where it's much more internalized. And it's just interesting to see Shakespeare done when it's done like that, where it's much more internal. And you see mm-hmm. the characters like instead because like on Shakespeare on stage, all the characters have to speak about what they're doing. Like I pick up the dagger and I stab him. Yeah, because Whereas that's the, the only film, way in Shakespeare's writing that you know that someone's supposed to pick up a dagger. Exactly. So basically the, the end of this whole rant that I had was like, it, it depends on the actor. Like if I were to give, I don't know, like if I were to give an up and coming actor, like someone who's only had a few credits, but they were popular, I would be careful about giving them Shakespeare unfiltered. But mm-hmm. if I had like Judy Dench or Ian McKellen or Derek Jacoby, I would just throw the, the folio at them and say, go to town. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's like, have fun. I'll follow your that, direction. Exactly. Like on the Graham Norton show, because I saw a clip of it. They He just asked Judy Dench, because I guess she has an encyclopedic memory of Shakespeare sonnets wow. and plays. Mm-hmm. He just asked her. She just gets better you... and better. I know. Like, fine <laughs> line. And it's like, he just asked her, can you read us a sonnet? And she said, okay. And she just spoke this on. It's like the entire audience was just dead silent. And it's just, yes, it's just a poem, but it's also like you're watching someone who knows what they're doing mm-hmm. perform. And it's just... So yeah, I, that's what I would say about like acting with Shakespeare and determining like whether you cut, you change, or what you right. do. Well, and the other no. thing you can do with film that you can't do with a with a stage play is 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 camera work. When you're watching yes. a play, you you're watching it from 
one perspective. You're hoping that you can see the full stage and you don't have a cheap ticket where the, you know, a third of the left side of the stage is is cut off. Yeah, right. Exactly. Cause like that was, that was one of the things I noticed about, about Kurosawa's throne of blood, which is an adaption of Macbeth, but set in feudal Japan, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, They used like slow uh, zoom shots, you know, when, when Macbeth kind of like starts, going crazy towards the end there's this there's a scene of him just like sitting you know in his room and because it's feudal japan you know it's very sparse there's there's next to no furniture and he's just sitting there and his face just subtly changes over the course of like 10 to 15 seconds and it just slowly moves in and it's like that's not shakespeare shakespeare didn't write that you you wouldn't do that in a play but it was so effective in you yes. seeing like in his eyes like the madness setting the insanity. in insanity yes yeah. it's yeah it's, and also just being able to <sighs> to like shoot in different locations or you know mm-hmm. and actually you know see you know in um um in Wells Othello you know mm-hmm. Othello and Iago you know they're on the top of the fortress looking over you know the water and Othello looks like he's ready to toss Iago over the cliff. You can't yep. you can't do that on a stage. You can fall off no. the side of the stage, but that's only a couple feet. That's not that's not as dramatic as having overhead shots of, you know, them on the cliff side. Right. Just just the and cinematography they, of it, yeah. And they didn't have obviously they didn't have anywhere near the ingenuity they do today, like with Phantom of the Opera, the famous like chandelier falling on the mm-hmm. audience. You've heard about that, right? Yeah. It's like they, they didn't have that, so it was purely up to the imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just made me think of like the whole idea of filming a stage play. It wouldn't work, you know. You know it's what? Like though, part of the I, thrill of the part of the thrill of the stage is the organic quality because it's different every time. And it's like those actors, like they roll with the punches. If the power goes out, they'll keep going. Yeah. I, I will say though, I did. Um, I didn't watch the whole thing. I think I only saw like maybe the first act, but there was. A, a play, a production of King Lear in Central Park back in the 90s. And King Lear was being played by James Earl Jones. Oh! And, they, and oh, you, you've, that it, voice. It's, it's on YouTube. It, it, oh, it was, it was amazing. Um, but it was, it was a performance in front of a live audience in Central Park, but it was being professionally filmed with multiple cameras and they weren't just static cameras. Um, so even though it was a stage production, like it was, it was still a film because it was edited. You know, it Camera wasn't someone standing in the audience, you know, videotaping it from their perspective. So even though it was mm-hmm. um, a play production, it it felt like a film the way it was. It was edited. It was just mm-hmm. everything took place, you know, on the same stage. Uh, characters walking in and off like it was a play. Um, but that right. was kind of a cool way to experience it mm-hmm. and james I mean, Earl Jones for, was just oh he was so good i mean <laughs> the, he, that goes back to like the actors it's like you yeah. just give james earl jones a script it's like go ahead yeah. i'll follow your lead um <laughs> you just made me think of like shakespeare in the park again it's yeah there was a video also released on youtube a few years ago i think i saw it on the news random blurb was an abbreviated version of taming of the shrew mm-hmm. it starred a pre-fame Meryl Streep and Raul Julia. Yes. And it's, it's like an hour long. So it was very heavily cut, very heavily edited. And it has little behind the scenes things where you get to see these two actors kind of like talking about their characters. And it's like, even though they're pre-fame and their very early career, you still see how, how genius they are with performing. How dedicated they are to their, their craft. And it was the same thing. It was like, um, the camera was like moving amongst them. Like it was obviously filmed with a live audience behind them, but like the camera had free reign to go on the stage and move mm-hmm. around them. Yeah. And just once again, it goes back to the energy that it was performed with because there's no stage directions, especially on the stage. Cause on a film you have to do with what the camera is telling you. It's co- It's right. very heavily choreographed and controlled. Right. Whereas on a stage, it's like, you know, Oh, someone fell slightly off cue. You just have to go with it. You can't yeah. redo it. Well, and, and um, when you, and when you're doing um, 
when you're doing a live play as well, especially if you're, you know, you, you know, you don't just put on a play for one night. Plays usually are put on for like a month at a time just because the amount of preparation and costume design and set design and everything that goes into yes. it, you know, to be able to show it to as many people. But as an actor, you can try different things between performances to see how the audience see reacts and work from that which that's something you can't really do in a film. You, you have, you know, you can do multiple takes, but then one person decides which is the one we're going to present. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, yeah, that's the thrill with the stage play. And like how you mentioned earlier, like wanting to see Shakespeare on stage or even like almost anything is like you get that organic quality and you can kind of say like, well, this happened on the stage. And then someone else might say, no, that, that didn't happen in my performance. This happened. And right. You'll, you'll get that variation and you get that very human quality. Um, but and yeah. Now, since you brought up Taming of the Shrew, this is a, a great segue into – Shakespeare film adaptions that don't use the text at all. So let's mm -hmm. let's talk about 10 things I hate about you. An amazing <laughs> early 2000s teenage rom-com. So I do have a confession. I've actually haven't seen that whole movie. Really? See, I, I, I know. it's so <laughs> funny that I say that now because I just saw it in full for the first time like three or mm -hmm. four days ago. And everyone's been giving me a hard time about it for my entire life. But the reason I, I had yeah. never seen it is because I assumed exactly what I said it was. It's an early 2000s teenage rom-com. I was like, right. big deal. But then I, I, I honestly didn't know the cast. I didn't, I didn't know. Um, Heath Ledger. Yeah, I didn't know Heath Ledger. I, God, I told myself I would remember the names of all of these actors, and I don't remember it any of them now that we're Let me here. Look it up. Kate. Julia Stiles. Julia Joseph Stiles. Gordon Levitt. Joseph Gordon yep. Levitt. Those were the two I was trying to, Yeah, I couldn't think of those. Yeah, Julia yep. Stiles, Joseph Gordon Levitt, uh, Heath Ledger. Um, and then, you know, it is it's an adaption of Taming of the Shrew. It's about yep. sister, it's about two sisters, and the younger sister is not allowed to date unless the older sister dates, but the older sister is ornery and doesn't like guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. and it, it's one of Shakespeare's very early plays. I think it's like one of the first five that he wrote and had performed. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just so interesting that a movie that's that big, that so many people in my life have been telling me, you have to see this movie. It's, you know, it's well done. It's funny. It's entertaining. And it was all of those things. But it's a Shakespeare adaption. Yep. And that's how and that's how you bring Shakespeare to the masses in modern times. You have to adapt it to the current culture. Right. You don't have to, exactly. but but you you know, you can. Right. And, and, and I mean, it's very it's, effective. Right, because the other version of Taming of the Shrew that I'm familiar with because we watched part of it in college was from the sixties. It might have also been Franco Zeffirelli directing it. Starred Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, which do oh, you wow. know about the, that okay, yeah, you I, do. Well, I, I, um, no, I what you're thinking of, I don't think I know. I just know who so they, they were. They were a, a famously married couple who were very, very fiery. They got divorced and remarried like two or three times. They were constantly fighting. Okay, they only worked like five or six hours out of the day, mm -hmm. but they were very hard workers. And it's they they were both a force to be reckoned with. And they were paired in like multiple movies together because even though they hated each other during or in guts, between romances, yes, okay. That's what I assumed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. So it's like you you get that dynamic of because especially with Taming of the Shrew, like Elizabeth Taylor hating this man, but then somehow still falling for him at the end and mm -hmm. still maintaining. It's like I'm an independent woman, but yeah, you've you've kind of got me. So yeah. it's, it's that that's the version that I'm always familiar with. It's much more traditionally told, like with the giant. Mm -hmm dresses and the, the the beautiful like scenery and stuff it's like that's the yeah. version i think of but yeah 10 things i hate about you it's yeah, yeah. but it's it's, 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 it. it's this just it's just these ideas that mm -hmm. the idea that that shakespeare stories can you know uh can be taken just into like uh, King, just uh, like you said. Uh, yeah a northwest uh you know high school po uh private high school the lion king mm -hmm. uh one of the ones i watched that was a little more it's obscure to me because I'm not familiar with Bollywood at all. It was the first like Bollywood film I had ever seen. I'm much mm -hmm. more familiar with Western cin cinema, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but um, 
uh, this guy named Vishal Bardwaj, who apparently he's he's mul- he's won multiple awards for multiple films. He's very well known in India, um, mm-hmm. but he did an adaption of Macbeth called Makbul. But it takes mm-hmm. it, it, I think it came out in like 2003, but it takes place in the Mumbai underground uh, among like organized crime families. So he basically takes Macbeth, but supr- you know, puts it in the style of the Indian Sopranos. Mm-hmm. But it was it was um, really it was really interesting. They took you know obviously the text was not the same, but the general concept of um, you know a lieutenant or um, someone's protege thinking this main character Makbul thinks the dawn of his family. Um, you know, is, is coming after him. And so his love interest has, you know, convinces him to kill him, to take over the family. And then people start suspecting that he had something to do with it, but it's Mm -hmm. set, but it's set in that, in that time. Um, And it was really cool because there were, there were a lot of scenes that obviously wouldn't have any place in, in Shakespeare, but they were, they took the, the ingredients of Macbeth, and then kind of created their own thing. It's like how we talked about uh, Nine Inch Nails and Johnny Cash or any sort Mm -hmm. of adaption like that. You know, they took something, um, found what inspired them to create their own thing, but they didn't shy away from the inspiration that it comes from. Right. It's, it's that, it's that not being afraid to change because part of like how we talked about, like whether, you know, Shakespeare should be left intact or whether it can be, abridged or whether it should be rewritten altogether for the modern sensibilities it's like not being afraid to change the play and you know saying well you know i want to keep the essence of it and i love these lines i love this idea but to fit my narrative i want i need to change it this way like lion king right you, know, you can't show simba being killed at the end <laughs> like you can't show that like that wouldn't he, that, that wouldn't be a hit for disney no it's like you can't show nala crying over his dead no you can't do that so it's like changing it to fit what works mm-hmm. and being unafraid to do that like how like we talked about denzel washington speaking in a conversational tone i'm sure that him and joel cohen spoke about that and wh- whoever had the idea it was probably avant-garde and it was mm-hmm. probably one of those things the other person said what do you mean it's like just try it and then they tried it it's like ooh, yeah um and then um 10 things i hate about you mm-hmm. somewhere one of the writers said what if we make it like a high school version of like you know, what we're taming of the shrew. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I'm sure they got a couple weird looks, but then you start writing and it's like, wait, this works. Yeah. So, so the, the fun it, part is like finding the way to adapt it. Like how, how in modern yeah. society do we, do we tell, have a dad that can say you can date, you can't date, you know, <laughs> but, but they made it yeah. work. They just made, uh, you know, he's a, he's a single dad. They, I don't, know if they ever say i assume the mom passed away i don't remember it's Mm -hmm. not important but like this single dad who wants his you know girls to do well but he he delivers babies he works in a hospital and delivers babies for a living and he's constantly telling them i have these young 15 and 16 year olds in here who are pregnant who say they never want to get pregnant so i don't want you kissing anybody you can't do this until your sister does it first because she or she's older and she knows better than to than to than to do that kind of thing yeah and then and then you and then you know you get the classic story you know she falls in love with a boy unexpectedly and there's there's twists and turns um but it's all rooted Mm -hmm. in in taming of the shrew and that that concept right it's like the way i think of it always is like a story is built up and built up it's like a garden over time and one of the things you can do is strip it down to its base materials mm-hmm. and you could take that and then rebuild, and then rebuild on, on it top of it what what you want done with it and again it's not like it's sacrilegious but it also depends what you're trying to do because obviously you part of the joke is you're taking taming of the shrew and putting it in a high school right. and that it works yeah. but like and doing hamlet in you know in the african sahara yeah right that yeah, it's like that worked because you're going for that. Whereas you know, okay, I want to tell Hamlet in a classical setting. It's like there's 
I don't, there's certain things that it's like, okay, yeah, you're going to hew more towards doing it the way Shakespeare wrote it and then doing it, changing it from what was written. Yeah. You know, it, well, it, it and, always and depends. It's like honest, that barometer. I, and I don't imagine, like I said, Boz Lerman is, is kind of the odd one out, but I don't, I don't, I haven't seen at least very many adaptions that keep true to the text, but don't keep true to the setting. That was one yeah, of the things with Boz Lerman's is he kept to the text, but he took it into like some futuristic Miami. Like I, I thought it was Brazil because they had like the maybe the, it's the Brazil, Christ of the Demer, I maybe think. it's Brazil, but 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 yeah, see, that, that's the other. It reminded see, that, that's, reminded me of like like Miami, but just like that kind of style. But see that aesthetic. part of it was like um like when they made Titus, you know Julie mm-hmm. Taymor's adaptation yep. of Titus, which is a brilliant film. Yeah. She, if you Great look film. at it. It's ancient Rome with motorcycles and modern buildings. Oh, and yeah. by the way, they have guns. They also mm-hmm. have bows and arrows. They have cars. They also ride around in chariots with horses. It's like they purposely obs- – and the cars, by the way, they're from like the early 40s. Yeah, right. It's like they the, purposely they're not modern cars. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's like just by that intro where the kid is – his, he's in the kitchen with the, vi- with the violence and the explosion and he's brought into the story. Right. It, and it's like – you're embracing this kind of like ridiculousness. So the dialogue does not feel out of place. That's the same thing with um, Romeo and Juliet. It's literally introduces itself with a TV screen. You enter the story and then you can't identify the city. You can't identify who these people are. Like literally all their nationalities are different. All their Mm -hmm. races are different. It's like, you you, you know, someone, a white guy might call a black guy, his brother. And be mm-hmm. literal about it. And it's like, you just embrace it. It's not necessarily ridiculous, but it's, it, you're making it acceptable to have this outlandish dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At that, t- at that point. And it's like, you're it's just all allowing about, like the fluidity of, of, exactly. the, of the place and time and the setting, because in Shakespeare, obviously, as, as we've kind of seen with everything we've talked about, like that's only so important. Right. You know, those, like, those, those are the cherries on top. Right. The director, like Boz Lerman, th- this to me shows he's got a very firm hand on his adaptations because it's like he knows what will work, what won't, and how it will work. It's like, no, we need to do this. And you can't quantify that all the mm-hmm. time. Like, why do you need to film in three or four different countries when it's this one single thing? You'll get it when I do it. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. It's just one of those things. Like, it's that sixth sense that artists have that's like look mm-hmm. i can't exactly explain it to you but it's going to work this is how it has to work and you can see that because when they're not allowed to do it it usually doesn't work right yeah so yeah um i think the one other thing i wanted to bring up as well and to start off mm-hmm. it is a question for you i don't know if you know the answer and i don't know the answer um when see. shakespeare was being performed in shakespeare's time did they have any sort of orchestra or music playing that wasn't just like announcing a scene or like a trumpet blaring to go? If they did, it was probably like a two. If they did, it was probably like a two or three piece musical troupe. Yeah, if anything, because you got to remember it was like a right. It was a tight space, probably. Yeah, but like that's one of that's that was one of the things that I really noticed about a lot of the films, especially um, uh, Macbul was the soundtrack and part of it mm-hmm. i think too that was stunning to me was because they were international so they they're using different timbres and instruments and ways of portraying tension and release differently than we do in western music um, yes exactly so like that was really cool Macbul would have long scenes of four or five six minutes of just music playing and like celebration and dancing and things like that um, well, I mean, you look at also like uh, Much Ado About Nothing, that Kenneth Branagh movie. Mm-hmm. They take they they make some of his dialogue into a song. It's like "Hey Nani mm-hmm. Nani" or whatever it's called. Yeah, yep. And it's again, you you get Shakespeare's very musical. Like his characters speak, and I think it's iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter. So, yeah. So it's it's very easy to just take that and. Like uh, the composer for all of Kenneth Branagh's films is uh, Patrick Doyle, who's a British composer. Mm -hmm. He also did a couple, one or two of the Harry Potter films. uh, Goblet of Fire. Okay, he did one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very good with film scores. You'll find this out. (laughs) Um, But yeah, no, he's like a stunning 
composer and it's a, it's like you already have the words that you just have to make the music around them which mm-hmm. actually that is a good question i'm actually going to look that up was their music with shakespeare plays because that because that's a big thing when it comes to to films that um i feel like people are either very aware of of the soundtrack when they're watching a movie or they're not aware of it whatsoever. And and it's good both ways. Not being aware of the soundtrack means it's not getting in, a, in the way of the story. It's doing its job yep. of expressing and telling you, telling you what you're supposed to be feeling or thinking right now about a certain character, exactly. even if that's not, not what's being shown. We'll get into it in another episode, hint, hint, everyone. But <laughs> my definite, like everyone's definition of a soundtrack or music is different. But mine is that, it needs to be rooted in emotion. So it doesn't have to be outlandish. It doesn't have to be weird. It needs to speak to you because if you're telling the story and it's your one human anchor, no matter what's going on on screen, Mm -hmm. it's the one thing that the audience could like latch on. Even if you didn't have, even if you didn't have subtitles and you're watching throne of blood in Japanese and you can't understand what they're saying Mm -hmm. just from the camera angles, people's facial expressions and the music being played at the right time, you might not know what the plot is, but you can you can you get a sense of what's happening, who's upset with who, um, right? Things like that. All mm-hmm. of that can be told just from from film and or, or sorry, not from film, film scores and and even just like even just lighting, just the way a shadow is cast across someone's face. Well, like characters enter and exit light, you can tell what they're talking about or how they're feeling. Right. Like all those little details, like directors do think about, mm-hmm. which is funny t- to realize. It's like even Citizen Kane, it's like the characters come in and out of light whenever they're talking. So, you know, it's like, oh, it's their dark side. It's their light side. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did look it up. If you were kicking around England in the late 1500s and stumbled upon a performance of a Shakespeare play, you might have heard some lute and viol interludes between scenes. Okay, yeah, a wind so band might have preceded the play, welcoming the audience. So not during the performance, right? But in that's between. kind of what I was thinking. Like you know, they have there might be like a trumpet call or something in between, and yeah, maybe like during during the intermission, yeah, or or as a way to tell you like, hey, this is the end of a scene or this is the end of an act. Um, or right. hey, we're transferring to a different location, but it wasn't something that was central to the plays themselves. And I assumed not right. because it's not something anyone's ever talked about. So I assumed that there wasn't music, or I'm sure right. I would have studied Shakespearean music when I was in college. Yep. You focus you know? on the dialogue, you focus on the performance. Yeah. So that's why, um, fun fact before we close out early films in the 20s and 30s Mm -hmm. when the talkies first began they didn't have soundtracks they only had diegetic sounds from on-set visible radios or orchestras because they were inspired by stage plays stage plays don't have accompanying music Mm -hmm. so that probably feeds into the idea of shakespeare it's like yeah of course you're not going to perform music during a play you won't hear the dialogue of course yeah that's well so, yeah, yeah i didn't honestly like as as simple as that seems i that's not something i'd even considered you yeah you wouldn't yeah, be able to watch, hear the dialogue over the music especially yeah, the, in a small enclosed place like a theater exactly watch the original dracula with bella lugosi there's not a single s- sound of music except for i think at some point they're in like an opera so mm-hmm. you hear the singing the opera like yeah. that that's literally it right so that's yeah, it now you'll notice it any old movie you watch you'll notice it yeah <laughs> so but yeah we'd like to take a brief moment to thank you for listening to story weavers for the enjoyment of our listeners we want to keep this podcast ad free and uninterrupted if you would like to support us further check out our options on Patreon. Plus, subscribing will get you behind-the-scenes content, bloopers, access to Book of the Month polls, and more. We appreciate any and all support. Now back to the episode. Yes. Well, I mean, people are still talking about his stuff 500 years later? And probably will be for another 500 years. Shakespeare's not going away anytime soon. And who knows what new... um, you know, I don't know if there's really any video games based on Shakespeare because we, you know, we did we we did say in a previous episode about how video games are kind of like the newest form of um, art media consumption. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
Um, so I don't know if, if we're really ever going to adapt Shakespeare into uh, video games. Uh, I don't know how well that would work out, but maybe some would, for, but, but yeah. maybe some form of adaption that would take something like a um, like a The Last of Us or something like that. Not that not taking The Last of Us, but so, a very narrative driven you know video game where the narrative mm-hmm. follows some sort of you know Shakespearean structure. That's exactly. probably been done, and we just don't know about it. I would say probably a much more inventive and creative person than either of us yeah. will figure out how to do it. And then it will <laughs> blow up into a sensation just like last of us. Who would have thought something like that would have worked? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of story weavers on Shakespeare film adaptions. And we can't wait to get back with you next week. Until next time, everyone take care. And thank you for listening to story weavers. Thank you for listening to this episode of Story Weavers. As ever, we're incredibly grateful to all of our listeners and contributors. Come back next week for the next installment of Story Weavers. Weavers.